Section 9 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kattekliek. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 2. Section 9. Excerpts from the Story of My Life and the Improvisatory by Hans Christian Andersen. The Marketplace at Odense, 1836. If the reader was a child who lived in Odense, he would just need to say the word St. Knutsver, and it would rise before him in the brightest colors, lighted by the beams of childish fancy. Somewhere near the middle of the town, five streets meet and make a little square there the town crier in striped homespun with a yellow bandolier beat his drum and proclaimed from a scroll the splendid things to be seen in the town he beats a good drum says the chamberlain it would delight spontini and rosini to hear the fellow said william really odense at new year would just suit these composers the drums and fives are in their glory they drum the new year in seven or eight little drummers or fifers go from door to door with troops of children and old women and they beat the drum taps and the rivoli that fetches the pennies then when the new year is well drummed in the city they go into the country and drum for meat and porridge the drumming in of the new year lasts until lent and then we have new sports said the chamberlain the fishers come from Steyr with a full band, and on their shoulders a boat with all sorts of flags. Then they lay a board between two boats, and on this two of the youngest and spryest wrestle till one falls into the water. But all the fun's gone now. When I was young, there was different sport going. That was a sight. The corporation procession with the banners and the harlequin atop, and at Travertide, when the butchers led about an ox decked with ribbons and carnival twigs with a boy on his back with wings and a little shirt all that's past now people are got so fine st knutsver is not what it used to be well i'm glad it isn't said william but let us go into the market and look at the jutlanders who are sitting with their pottery amidst the hay just as the various professions in the middle ages had each its quarter so here the shoemakers had ranged their tables side by side and behind them stood the skilful workman in his long coat and with his well-brushed felt hat in his hand where the shoemaker's quarter ended the hatters began and there one was in the midst of the great market where tents and booths formed many parallel streets the milliners the goldsmiths the pastry cooks with booths of canvas and wood were the chief attractions ribbons and handkerchiefs fluttered noise and bustle was everywhere the girls from the same village always went in rows seven or eight inseparables with hands fast clasped it was impossible to break the chain and if you tried to pass through the whole band wound itself into a clump behind the booth was a great space with wooden shoes pottery turners and saddlers wares rude and rough toys were spread on tables around them children were trying little trumpets or moving about the playthings country girls trilled and twisted the work boxes and themselves many a time before making their bargain the air was thick and heavy with odors that were spiced with the smell of honey cake on fair day st knut's church and all its tombs are open for the public from whatever side you look at this fine old building it has something imposing with its high tower and spire the interior produces the same perhaps a greater effect but its full impression is not felt on entering it nor until you get to the main aisle there all is grand beautiful light the whole interior is bright with gilding up in the high vaulted roof there shines since old time a multitude of golden stars 
On both sides, high up above the side aisles, are great Gothic windows from which the light streams down. The side aisles are painted with oil portraits, whole families, women and children, all in clerical dress, with long gowns and deep ruffs. Usually the figures are ranged by ages, the eldest first, and then down to the very smallest. They all stand with folded hands, and look piously down before them, till their colors have gradually faded away in dust. THE ANDERSON JUBILEE AT ODENS I heard on the morning of December 6th, 1867, that the town was decorated, that all the schools had a holiday, because it was my festival. I felt myself as humble, meek, and poor as though I stood before my God. Every weakness or error or sin in thought, word, and deed was revealed to me. All stood out strangely clear in my soul, as though it were doomsday, and it was my festival. God knows how humble I felt when men exalted and honored me so. Then came the first telegram from the student club. I saw what they shared and did not envy my joy. Then came a dispatch from a private club of students in Copenhagen, and from the artisans' club of Sleuse. You will remember that I went to school in that town, and was therefore attached to it. Soon followed messages from sympathetic friends in Aarhus, in Steer, telegram on telegram from all around. One of these was read aloud by Privy Councillor Koch. It was from the King. The assembly burst out in applause. Every cloud and shadow in my soul vanished. How happy I was, and yet man must not exalt himself. I was to feel that I was only a poor child of humanity, bound by the frailty of earth. I suffered from a dreadful toothache, which was increased unbearably by the heat and excitement. Yet at evening I read a wonder story for the little friends. Then the deputation came from the town corporations, with torches and waving banners through the street to the guild hall. And now the prophecy was to be fulfilled that the old woman gave when I left home as a boy. Odin's was to be illuminated for me. I stepped to the open window. All was aglow with torchlight. The square was filled with people. Songs swelled up to me. I was overcome emotionally. Physically racked with pain, I could not enjoy this crowning fruit of my life. The toothache was so intolerable. The ice-cold air that blew against me fanned the pain to an awful intensity, and instead of enjoying the bliss of these never-to-be-repeated moments, I looked at the printed song to see how many verses had to be sung before I could step away from the torture which the cold air sent through my teeth. It was the acme of suffering. As the glow of the piled-up torches subsided, my pain subsided too. How thankful I was, though! Gentle eyes were fastened upon me all around. All wanted to speak with me, to press my hand. Tired out, I reached the bishop's house and sought rest. But I got no sleep till toward morning. So filled and overflowing was I. Miserere in the Sixteen Chapel From the Improvisator Translation by Mary Howitt On Wednesday afternoon began the Miserere in the Sixteen Chapel. My soul longed for music. In the world of melody I could find sympathy and consolation. The throng was great, even within the chapel. The foremost division was already filled with ladies. Magnificent boxes hung with velvet and golden draperies for royal personages and foreigners from various courts were here erected so high that they looked out beyond the richly carved railing which separated the ladies from the interior of the chapel. The papal Swiss guards stood in their bright festal array. The officers wore light armor, and in their helmets a waving plume. The old cardinals entered in their magnificent scarlet velvet cloaks, with their white ermine capes, and seated themselves side by side in a great half-circle within the barrier, while the priests who had carried their trains seated themselves at their feet. By the little side door of the altar, the Holy Father now entered, 
in his scarlet mantle and silver tiara. He ascended his throne. Bishops swung the vessel of incense around him, while young priests in scarlet vestments knelt with lighted torches in their hands before him and the high altar. The reading of the lessons began, but it was impossible to keep the eyes fixed on the lifeless letters of the missal. They raised themselves with the thoughts to the vast universe which Michelangelo has breathed forth in colors upon the ceiling and the walls. I contemplated his mighty sibyls and wondrously glorious prophets, every one of them a subject for a painting. My eyes drank in the magnificent processions, the beautiful groups of angels. They were not to me painted pictures, all stood living before me. The rich tree of knowledge, from which Eve gave the fruit to Adam, the almighty God who floated over the waters, not borne up by angels, as the older masters had represented him, no, the company of angels rested upon him and his fluttering garments. It is true, I had seen these pictures before, but never as now had they seized upon me. My excited state of mind, the crowd of people, perhaps even the lyric of my thoughts, made me wonderfully alive to poetical impressions, and many a poet's heart has felt as mine did. The bold foreshortenings, the determinate force with which every figure steps forward, is amazing, and carries one quite away. It is a spiritual sermon on the mount, in color and form. Like Raphael, we stand in astonishment before the power of Michelangelo, Every prophet is a Moses like that which he formed in marble. What giant forms are those which seize upon our eye and our thoughts as we enter? But when intoxicated with this view, let us turn our eyes to the background of the chapel, whose whole wall is a high altar of art and thought. The great chaotic picture, from the floor to the roof, shows itself there like a jewel, of which all the rest is only the setting. We see there the last judgment. Christ stands in judgment upon the clouds, and his mother and the apostles stretch forth their hands beseechingly for the poor human race. The dead raise the gravestones under which they have lain, blessed spirits adoring, float upward to God, while the abyss seizes its victims. Here one of the ascending spirits seeks to save his condemned brother, whom the abyss already embraces in its snaky folds. The children of despair strike their clenched fists upon their brows and sink into the depths. In bold foreshortenings float and tumble whole legions between heaven and earth. The sympathy of the angels, the expression of lovers who meet, the child that at the sound of the trumpet clings to the mother's breast, are so natural and beautiful that one believes oneself to be among those who are waiting for the judgment. Michelangelo has expressed in colors what Dante saw and has sung to the generations of the earth. The descending sun at that moment threw his last beams in through the uppermost window. Christ and the blessed around him were strongly lighted up, while the lower part, where the dead arose, and the demons thrust their boat laden with the damned from the shore, were almost in darkness. Just as the sun went down, the last lesson was ended, the last light, which now remained, was extinguished, and the whole picture world vanished in the gloom from before me. But in that same moment burst forth music and singing. That which color had bodily revealed arose now in sound. The day of judgment, with its despair and its exultation, resounded above us, the father of the church, stripped of his papal pomp, stood before the altar and prayed to the holy cross, and upon the wings of the trumpet resounded the trembling choir. Soft angel tones rose above the deep song, tones which ascended not from a human breast, it was not a man's nor a woman's, it belonged to the world of spirits. It was like the weeping of angels dissolved in melody. 
End of section 9